Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Doug Hilton. Uh, I'm the director of the Walsh and Eliza Hall Institute, and I'd like to welcome our special guests, Professor Laura Esselman, um, who is director of the UCSF Carol Frank Buck Breast Care Centre, and I won't go through the rest of the titles, um, Julie Hassad, who's the National Program Manager of Breast Cancer Network Australia, and Carol Renouf, who's CEO of the Nas National Breast Cancer Foundation, along with lots of friends and colleagues. It's wonderful to be able to introduce you to, to the Institute, for those of you who've not visited. Um, we are an organisation of upward of 800 researchers. Uh, half of us work broadly on cancer, and we have a strong breast cancer program that's, left, uh, that's led by Jeff Lindemann and, and Jane Visvader. Um, the rest of the Institute works on two other areas, infectious disease, primarily malaria, but also TB, uh, HIV and, and hepatitis, and autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. So as an Institute, um, a large proportion of our effort is focused on, on understanding and better treating cancer. And that, I think, really captures the goals of the Institute. We want, on the one hand, to be making the types of discoveries that in many ways excite other scientists, that change the way we think about basic biology and disease, but at the same time and with equal emphasis, we want to be making um, translational breakthroughs that lead to the, the better prevention, diagnosis or treatment of, of illness. And we all know how important that is in the area of breast cancer. Um, like many of you, uh, my family was touched by breast cancer about 18 months ago when my wife was diagnosed. She sends her apologies. She's doing the triathlon at Noosa this week. She did it a year ago. That I think the irony is she did it a year ago um, in the middle of her chemotherapy and, and radiotherapy and got a better time than she did this year with a year additional recovery. But I think that might be the progress of age. Um, so I'm also going to apologise. Because she's in Noosa, I'm going to have to scarf her off after the introduction to take care of my two boys who are in the middle of exams and need to be studying rather than doing what they are probably doing at the moment, which isn't studying. So with that, I'd like to introduce Jeff Lindemann. I'd like to thank you all for coming to the Institute and I hope you find this lecture series as informative as I find the other public lecture series we've had here. So thanks very much. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Doug, and uh, welcome to everybody who's come today. We're very grateful. As Doug said, it's really a, an open institute which we believe belongs uh, to the public. Much of the um, funding that uh, helps run an institute like this is through um, uh, either public donations or, uh, or government support through the writing of government grants. So we, in a sense, very much have a duty of care to let you know about what's happening uh, in the Institute and to let you know about what's happening um, in the various areas that scientists are particularly passionate about that they spend a lot of their time thinking about. So one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about with Jane Visvader is uh, breast cancer and how we can uh, potentially make a, distance, a difference in, uh, through understanding basic biology. And uh, so we're really fortunate today to, to have uh, three speakers that I'd, I'd like to introduce. Um, who will uh, uh, give us, uh, I think, a, a big picture of uh, the breast cancer scene in Australia. And then, of course, Laura Esselman, who's going to talk to us about um, how important biology is to make a difference in the longer term for breast cancer management. Um, but first, I'd like to introduce um, the CEO, the Chief Executive Officer of the National Breast Cancer Foundation, Carol Renouf. Uh, now, the NBCF plays a very important role in um, helping to fund initiatives uh, uh, in the breast cancer space and, and has, uh, over not such a uh, long time, actually become one of the, the very prominent uh, fundraisers for breast cancer, delivering money to uh, scientists through competitive research grants, which are highly prized and uh, certainly very important to make initiatives uh, move forward that are going to help people affected by breast cancer, uh, people who would like to avoid being affected by breast cancer and um, also quality of life issues. So I'll introduce uh, Carol. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thank you, Jeff, and um, welcome, everybody. 
I've been asked to um, just say a few brief words to you about the National Breast Cancer Foundation this evening and, and the type of work that we do. Oops, okay. So this is um, quick and easy shorthand for doing that. Um, we've got a very simple business model. Essentially, we raise funds on the one hand and on the other hand, we grant funds. So we start, if you like, by um, stimulating, if I can use that word, the community to um, uh, initiate activity that will help us raise funds. And people do that through all sorts of different ways and we bless each and every one of them and, and thank them for that tonight. But um, we have um, individuals that run large or small events for us to raise money around the country we have individuals or community groups that also simply donate money. And we also have a series of corporate partnerships uh, working with companies who donate or, or help us raise money. Response to, to our request to the community, the community generates the funds. Thirdly, then, we grant the funds to the research community to, to do what they do best. But at the end of the day, it's essentially all about knowledge that is generated by the research community to return health benefits back to you guys. So that's the way it works. Just to give you a bit of an insight into how we're tracking, um, our financial year closes in June. So in this past financial year, we had a, a healthy year. We uh, had income of $23 million, thanks to the community. <coughs> And we were able to invest $18.8 .8 million in research. And you'll see there we have a wide range of different funding schemes. And I won't go into all of them due to um, you know, time limitations, but you might be particularly interested, for example, in our novel concept awards scheme, which is a type of funding that very few other funders will give. So that is about really generating left of field radical innovative approaches to breast cancer and, and seed funding those. You might also be interested in our translational grant scheme. And actually, um, Jeff and his team are the holders of our inaugural translational grant award, which is all about achieving speed to market. So driving discoveries in the lab quickly into clinical practice. So we really try not to just, um, I guess, award money, but use the funds that you help us raise to um, make the research system work more effectively, um, more quickly, et cetera. We've also recruited in this past year for 12 research projects through Register 4. Now, you may or may not be familiar with Register 4, but that's an NBCF initiative which is about, again, um, trying to save time and money and accelerate are the results of research coming back to the community. So it's our database of community members who are willing to participate in breast cancer research. It's people-centered research, so it might be things like uh, studies into cancer and fertility or cancer and sexuality or lymphedema, those types of things, better management of lymphedema. And we've managed to recruit and fast track 12 projects in this past year interestingly, projects that um, researchers typically need a lot of time and expense to recruit for, we've been able to cut that recruitment time in some cases from two years down to 48 hours through use of Register 4. I thought you might quickly also be interested to know that um, 2013 calendar year has seen the start um, and it will see the finish at the end of this year of a new project for us what we've called our community conversations. So essentially, um, these have been a series of consultations with anybody in the community that would like to talk with us about any type of cancer. So extending also beyond breast cancer. And given that we are community funded, we felt it was very important that we reach out to the community, people who um, have been indirectly or directly affected by cancer, and understand where they think the gaps are, where their needs are currently not being met, and what research, therefore, we could fund in those spaces. 
So there's been, or there will be by the end of this month, 13 of those that we've conducted around the country. And there are some strong themes and needs of research emerging. And I thought um, you might be interested for me just to share a couple of those with you. Very strong theme emerging around young people with cancer and in particular young women with breast cancer um, who have a very different set of needs, if you like, to women of my age with breast cancer. So, um, you know, impacting on young women are things like the effects of treatment in terms of uh, perhaps causing early menopause, um, implications for future childbearing and fertility, those types of needs. And there are now, I think it's about 800 women under 40, often, you know, as young as in their 20s, being diagnosed with breast cancer each year in Australia. So uh, a real need for more work in that area being a flag to us. Another area is advanced disease. So in other words, where the cancer has spread from the primary organ, the breast, to other organs such as the brain, lungs, liver, bone. Um, there, there is not a great deal of understanding um, in this area in terms of the needs of women with advanced breast cancer, probably because they didn't really used to survive the way they're surviving these days. Not all of them, but some of them at least will live 10 to 15 years with advanced disease thanks to the treatments that are currently available. And, and there's a real need for more research into that area and obviously also into the process of metastasis and how we can intervene to stop the spread of the cancer because, of course, that's what causes death. Um, strong theme coming through across all cancers, in fact, in terms of the need for better chemotherapy. Um, you know, obviously public acknowledgement that chemotherapy is great in the sense that it, it works and it kills the cancer cells and it saves lives, but at the same time it tends to kill off a lot of other things as well. And we, we're funding a number of projects currently looking at mechanisms to direct the chemo straight to the cancer cells, bypassing the healthy cells, and therefore really reducing the side effects. Another strong theme has been the need for, um, I guess what you might call more health services delivery research. So looking at what is actually happening in practice. And one of the things people have been telling us is that in practice at the GP level, it's not the only level, but at the GP level uh, in particular, there's a need for more, more education around diagnosis, communication, how then to liaise with the other services that the person with breast cancer will need. And above all, a very strong theme about acceleration of results. Um, questions around why does it take on an average 17 years for an initial discovery in the lab to filter through to clinical practice. And people saying to us, that's too long. We haven't got that much time. We need you to go faster. So just, this is my last slide. Um, I, I just wanted, I guess, to reassure you that um, we're listening to all of that and we will be producing a report on the outcomes of the community conversations for the federal government and also for anyone that's interested in the cancer research space in early next year. We've just actually today at the Walter and Eliza Hall had the uh, pleasure of running a training workshop for researchers in terms of um, I guess promoting greater engagement of consumers, and consumers is the trade term for people with cancer or people with breast cancer or um, anyone that you know cares or cares for them or loves them. And um, I guess just trying to um, push this idea that your research will have much greater impact. It's a known fact. There are studies that show your research will have much greater impact if in fact consumers are involved in it in some way, whether that's in the planning and design or the conduct of the research or the, evalu the evaluation of the research. So that's a theme that we're running hard with into next year. Um, it's, it's very easy in research, just because of the nature of the process, to um, create you know, a significant distance between yourself as a researcher and the end users and beneficiaries of the research. So I, I just wanted to end with the 
assurance to you, as I know you're mainly members of the public, I think, that um, we're running hard with this issue and doing all we can to help researchers reach out to you more and, and involve you in what they're doing because your perspective is extraordinarily useful. That's it from me. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Carol. I'd also uh, now like to introduce uh, Julie Hassard. So Julie um, represents Breast Cancer Network Australia, and I imagine um, uh, many of you are aware of uh, that, that organisation. She's the National Programs Manager for uh, BCNA. This uh, represents some 85,000 women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, who I think form a very important um, part of uh, the community, as, as you've heard, um, for helping to invigorate activity both at the research level but also at the um, government level to make sure that um, uh, things can be progressed. And I think acting as advocates um, not only for breast cancer patients but um, more broadly for uh, the cancer issue. So I'd like to introduce Julie. Thanks very much. Thanks, well, thank you very much, Jeff, for inviting us along today. Um, and I'm, um, I'm here really representing our CEO, Maxine Moran, who's currently in Portugal attending the Advanced Breast Cancer Conference over there. So um, a great opportunity. But I'm thrilled to be here. And, and again, thank you for having us here. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Breast Cancer Network Australia, we are Australia's peak breast cancer consumer organisation. And um, you may know of us from our Field of Women Live events, which have, we've been holding over the past number of years in Melbourne at, at the MCG, which you can see here, and also in Sydney in the past. Now, these spectacular events highlight the number of people diagnosed with breast cancer each year and we know this year, we anticipate that approximately 15,000 women and about 125 men will be diagnosed with breast cancer, or have been diagnosed throughout the year. Um, and unfortunately, that approximately 2,500 uh, people will die from the disease this year. So we are a network of people across Australia who are affected by breast cancer. And we are coming up to our 15th anniversary this year. We started in 1998, driven by a small group of committed women and passionate about their, their cause, led by um, Lynn Swinburne, who many of you will know as our founder. So as a network of um, members across Australia. In fact, Jeff touched on the fact that we do have 85,000 members currently making up our network. And over 90% of those are people who have been diagnosed with breast cancer themselves. Some of our members are um, supporters of people who are diagnosed. So pretty much people who are affected by breast cancer. We also have about 10,000. We're just coming up to 10,000 members of our online network. And um, these are people who are connecting and supporting one another, um, many who live in more rural and remote locations. So the connection, that peer support, which we know is um, essential in, in helping one another through the breast cancer journey, is happening in that way as well. We have about 300 support groups within our network. These groups that welcome um, those who are newly diagnosed, they get together regularly to share experiences and to support one another and to look out for family members, of course, when things get tough. We have about 275 community liaisons, and these are um, people who are trained, who have experienced breast cancer themselves, who are trained to use their breast cancer stories to raise public awareness in media, uh, in communities where they live, and to educate medical students. And it's through asking people, as Carol has referred to um, in the previous presentation, it's through asking the people who've been affected by breast cancer um, about their experience that we have also produced a number of um, resources. You'll see an image here of our My Journey kit. We post approximately 1,000 My Journey kits out every month to people who are newly diagnosed. And in fact, we're reaching around about 82% of the 15,000 who are diagnosed every year. 
um, at no cost to them, which is important. Another of our resources, the Hope and Hurdles Pack, is um, especially designed. It's a similar resource, particularly for those living with advanced breast cancer or secondary breast cancer, and it's tailored to their individual situation. Our major resources and our range of booklets and fact sheets, like this new resource we've just developed called I Wish I Could Fix It, a resource for partners, male and female partners of people diagnosed with breast cancer, um, are, are available uh, free of charge and um, are available on our website or as hard copies. Hmm. Just to mention also that all the resources that we produce are based on the current research, the current evidence. They're updated regularly and the cost, the, 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 the cost being free is really important to us. We started out, as I said, in 1998 as an advocacy group. We wanted the focus of breast cancer to be more about the person diagnosed with the disease rather than simply about the breast and the tumour. We actually wanted to change the system in a number of ways. We, said, we found that it was important that women and men were well informed and well supported emotionally. It was also important that they were connected to others in similar situations and that their partners and families were part of the picture. So through raising our voices and gathering momentum, we've made a lot of progress over the past 15 years. More people can now access breast cancer treatments without having to mortgage their homes. Many more people diagnosed with breast cancer nowadays are accompanied by a dedicated breast cancer nurse. More health professionals understand the type of information and support that individuals need and when they need it than they did perhaps, say, 10 or 20 years ago. More people are actually actively participating in the decisions related to their own treatment and care. And while much of the success was achieved through the combined voices, um, of the thousands of people affected by breast cancer, the strong connections and partnerships we have developed with breast cancer clinicians, scientists and researchers has been just as important. We've got strong connections with breast cancer and other relevant clinicians. Our dedicated board of directors um, includes a number of women and men affected by breast cancer and also includes a breast cancer surgeon and a medical oncologist. Our strategic advisory group, of breast cancer clinicians provides advice and expertise when we develop our resources such as our My Journey Kit and in other times when we're wanting to ensure that we're up to date with what's current. Many of them also give generously of their time to present at the information forums that we hold around about once a month across the country to people living with, with, with breast cancer across Australia. So as a consumer organisation with strong links to medical researchers and clinicians, we're well aware of the breast cancer science, the latest clinical and medical research, and the latest emer and emerging options for breast cancer treatment. Oh, looks like my printing's been a little bit, there it is. Um, one of the ways we contact breast cancer consumers with Sorry, one of the ways we connect breast cancer consumers with researchers is through our review and survey group. So this group um, comprises about 2,500 people, mostly women who've been affected by breast cancer, who've been diagnosed with breast cancer. They've um, elected to sign up to receive invitations from us um, to participate in research studies or to comment on the development of resources. And we act on behalf of many, many um, universities and other research organisations to um, link them with the women in this group. And in the past five years, we've sent out invitations to the group members to, to participate in around about 125 research projects. Um, now, look, I think this is a valuable example of breast cancer consumers and researchers working together for mutual gains. As a consumer organisation, we believe it's extremely important that the people affected by breast cancer take a seat at the table and can participate and contribute wherever decisions are made about breast cancer treatment, care and research, really mirroring what Carol has just been talking about. Over the past 15 years, we've trained 120 consumer representatives in breast cancer science and advocacy. 
They represent Australians affected by breast cancer on committees, on research advisory groups, on government advisory groups, and they participate in studies to bridge that gap between the science and the real life experience of breast cancer. So since 2007, our advocates have been involved in around 400 projects and research projects account for over half of those appointments. I'd like to give you two examples. The Royal Australian College of, Je of Breast Surgeons um, approached BCNA, Wet Breast Cancer Network, when they set up what was known as the SNAC trial. This was the first Australian trial investigating whether sentinel node biopsy, then a new technique for determining the extent of breast cancer beyond the breast, beyond the breast was as safe and accurate as removing the lymph nodes themselves to determine the presence of breast cancer cells. Avis McPhee has worked um, as a dedicated breast cancer consumer advocate since the early 1990s. And Avis, um, as one of our representatives, was appointed to this study. Now, she was involved in all aspects of the trial from the very beginning. Um, she contributed to the recruitment of participants. She made sure that the patient information was clear and understandable, a basic thing, but something that's sometimes overlooked. And she um, ensured that there was a newsletter given out to trial participants um, to keep them up to date and informed about how the trial was going. <laughs> Uh, and the trial coordinator at that time is quoted as saying, BCNA's support has been critical to the success of the study. And I sincerely hope consumer groups' roles in clinical trials increase further, as I feel their input is invaluable. It was, was recognised um, that a major contributor to the successful recruitment of people to that trial was Avis's involvement from the very beginning to the very end. Now, Gerda Evans, who I believe is here, I can see that she's here in the audience, is another of our long-standing consumer representatives. Gerda has a strong interest in familial and genetic breast cancer and has represented consumers on the K-CONFAB executive committee over many years. For those of you not aware, K-CONFAB brings together geneticists, clinicians, surgeons, genetic counsellors, psychosocial researchers, pathologists, epidemiologists and, of course, um, breast cancer consumers from across Australia and New Zealand. And they believe that the causes and consequences of familial predisposition to breast cancer can be understood only by, the, by a concerted national effort at both, the, at both the basic and the clinical level. So Gerda and Avis are just two of the 120 women have, who have sat at the table of many committees and projects um, to represent Australians affected by breast cancer. So a membership of 85,000 this year will become around 125,000 by 2016, just based on the number of people who will be diagnosed with breast cancer over the next few years. The connection between research and real life breast cancer experience will continue to be of paramount importance to us to ensure that successful outcomes continue, not only for researchers and medical scientists, but ultimately for the thousands of people the men and women who are diagnosed and living with breast cancer every year. So I'm going to finish up there and just um, meant, oh, should be, you know, that's the, our phone number also I'll note is 1800 500 258, didn't make it to the slide. But if there's anything else that you want to find out about Breast Cancer Network Australia, please don't hesitate to contact us. And look, I wish everyone the very best of luck for a highly successful conference over the next couple of days. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Julie, for that. Um, what we thought we'd do is to let people have questions at the end, um, if, if that's OK. Could I have the first slide, please? Um, so look, I'm just going to speak for a few minutes um, and, and introduce Laura. But um, a, as you heard, um, breast cancer is uh, the most common uh, cancer to affect women. And in fact, the lifetime, over a woman's lifetime in Australia, is some one in eight chance of being diagnosed by this disease. And uh, in fact, as you heard this year, uh, it's likely that uh, up close to 15,000 women will be diagnosed with the disease. Uh, this pie chart here really just gives you some sense of the um, uh, complexity of the, the problem with the uh, proportion of breast cancers diagnosed, um, uh, this pie chart being from Australia, but uh, representing, um, from Victoria, but uh, would be very 
similar for Australia and in fact a lot of the developed world. Um, as you've heard, the number of uh, diagnoses is like projected to rise to about 17,000 by 2020. So it's not an issue in terms of incidence that is going to go away. Um, I think there is some good news though, and, and that is that um, even though the incidence of breast cancer has, has arisen, is rising by about 2% per year, since the mid 1990s, we've seen mortality fall by about 30%. And that's, I think, a very important and sobering fact. Um, you can see there's a little thin line there which indicates the year that uh, breast screen was introduced into Australia. Uh, but really the benefits from breast screen are probably only beginning to be felt now. A lot of that reduction in mortality, um, uh, which has gone from about 30 uh, women per 100,000 to 20 uh, women per 100,000, is actually due to the introduction of uh, better therapies um, as part of, um, in fact, reduced uh, amount of surgery that, that uh, women and men are requiring. That's through what's known as adjuvant treatments, uh, which can involve chemotherapy or endocrine therapy in the form of drugs like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. So we really are seeing um, uh, substantial improvements. But the uh, uh, it's also quite clear that there's still a way to go. There's certainly a gap. There. And, and I think that's where uh, certainly the view of uh, scientists and uh, many clinicians is that uh, that gap needs to be filled by a better understanding of the uh, complexity of uh, breast cancer, which is increasingly being recognised as not simply being one disease, but being a very heterogeneous disease in terms of uh, being made up of multiple subtypes. So it's really understanding the nature of, of the disease, which I think is going to make that incremental improvement that uh, <coughs> to, uh, uh, completes uh, that, that gap over the next uh, few decades. And certainly the pace that uh, genetics and uh, our understanding of uh, the cellular origins of cancer is, is developing, um, I think that's certainly a, a vital goal. So. Our own group at WEHI, and that's uh, Jane Visvader and myself and some a, a group of very dedicated scientists are really interested in understanding the cellular and genetic basis of breast cancer. We're very much interested in knowing how a very normal uh, stem cell can give rise to daughter cells, which then can give rise to cells which populate the whole ductal tree within a breast because these are the culprit cells which can ultimately uh, 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 undergo genetic changes and then give rise to breast cancer. Now, I'm not going to go through any of this in detail today, but certainly if there's uh, questions, one, we can address that at the end. And there's also, I think, some, an insert in the packs you've all received. We're also very interested in knowing what role female hormones play in uh, regulating this normal cellular hierarchy and how things go awry when um, breast cancer happens. And for example, we know that the stem cell in the breast is, is uh, a negative for uh, um, uh, the hormone receptors, uh, which makes cells respond to female hormones, but yet they're very, very responsive to hormones, and that's through signaling from partner cells. And uh, unlocking the molecular mechanisms there is giving us some clues as to some strategies we could might perhaps uh, uh, move uh, to, to the clinic to try to help prevent breast cancer. One of the important things I think that uh, our next speaker will touch on is um, how can we harness this knowledge to really personalise treatment and to fast track um, delivery of um, uh, new therapies to the clinic and also make sure that uh, people don't get overtreated because currently we often treat uh, some types of breast cancer in a one size fits all approach. To try to overcome that, um, uh, our group has formed an alliance with uh, several other groups around Australia by, by forming a centre that is focused on uh, trying to take early discoveries to the clinic um, and to use tissue from patients' uh, biopsy samples that, uh, to, that could be exploited to improve and fast track cancer research. So what I'd like to do now is to introduce uh, Laura Esserman, who's um, uh, from the uh, UCSF. She's, as you heard, the director of the Carol Frank Buck Breast Cancer Center in San Francisco and herself um, uh, founded a center of excellence for breast cancer care that is focused on integrating um, care and research. She's published over 190 research articles, um, not all of which I think she'll describe today. Um, 
but uh, some selected parts of um, her dossier. Um, I was impressed to see that she's a member of the task force for President Obama's Council of Advisors for Science and Technology. Um, and it's good to see that in at least the US, uh, there is some representation that goes to government. Um, in our case, we seem to be lacking a science minister at present, but hopefully there are, there are ways that, um, uh, that uh, government can hear the importance of science in improving patient outcomes. And perhaps Laura can ask uh, Barak to um, keep printing that money for one extra day and sending it across to uh, <laughs> cancer researchers around the world. Um, and as I think you'll hear, she's principal investigator on a very innovative um, uh, clinical trial approach called the ISPIRE trial, which is uh, very deliberately aimed at um, getting novel therapies into the clinic. So it's with great pressure that I'd uh, thank Laura for flying all the way across the Pacific for a conference uh, and uh, for the next two days and for also speaking at this forum today. Thank you, Laura. Thanks so much for that really nice introduction. And it's really a pleasure to be here. And <clears throat> Jane, I also am impatient and feel that the uh, 17 years to get drugs from or new ideas from the clinic into an FDA approved uh, treatment is way, way, way too long. And the whole idea of the ISPY trial is to accelerate that, that uh, pathway. And one of the one of the things we're working on, hopefully together, will be a way to participate in taking it promising agents and with a worldwide consortium faster, better, and more efficiently getting them, uh, uh, proving whether or not they really are something that should be given to everybody and getting them accelerated approval. Uh, so that's something that we hope very much to be working on with the uh, with our colleagues in, in Melbourne and, and hopefully Sydney as well. Uh, so I'm very much concerned about the people who have lethal cancer, but I also want to talk tonight about an issue which is about overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And I think the, uh, it's really important for the public to understand these issues so that when they hear about ideas for change, they are not concerned. So on the one hand, we'll leave some of the more serious cancers behind and talk a little bit about how is it possible uh, that there's a problem with overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and what is it that we can do about it? And this is really an important lesson for us that the insights from biology are just essential for improving care. And by understanding those cancers that behave well, it will also teach us about the cancers that behave badly and help us hopefully focus most on making a difference most quickly for those uh, where it does make a difference. One of the reasons why I want to address this is because uh, more and more people are being diagnosed with cancer. And as our population ages, cancer is going to be uh, something that over a third of the population uh, receives, uh, where it gets a diagnosis. And when people hear the word cancer, most people think about this definition that's in Webster uh, <coughs> or dictionary.com. Actually, I have to admit that's where I got this one. Um, an evil condition or a thing that spreads destructively, a blight. So in fact, most patients assume that a cancer left untreated will kill you. And in fact, most physicians do too. So often we hear that when someone's diagnosed that they should go to the operating room or something should happen or DCS, they have to be treated immediately. But in fact, um, uh, many of these are not necessarily destined for lethal progression and it's never an emergency. And that actually is a key thing for everyone to understand because you have time to understand the facts and understand your personal situation so you can make the decision that is right for you. And increasingly, uh, as Jeff and others have been saying, is that we understand that breast cancer is not one disease. One size does not fit all in treatment. And we are really trying to hone in on how to figure out how to treat each specific breast cancer subtype with the most appropriate treatments. So it cannot be that if in treatment, we're starting to need to give people different kinds of treatment, it cannot be that screening and prevention should be the same for all women. That doesn't make sense either. So how is it that we have been thinking about early detection? 
And early detection, for the most part, has not changed in about 30 years. And I think there's a tremendous opportunity for us to think about how to make some big changes. And we're going to talk about some of the things that are good and some of the things that are bad and maybe some of the ways in which we can change it. But, you know, the finding in, in cancer was always that, wow, if, if the people with stage 2 or 3 cancer had much worse outcomes than the people with stage 1 cancer or the people with, you know, precancerous or, or in situ cancers, then it may, would make sense that if you could just catch that disease early, that you would necessarily save lives. And there was a, 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 the promise of early screening, and this has been seen in the push for breast cancer or the push for ovarian cancer, is that if we could only get those cancers early, that we would therefore be able to drop the mortality rates dramatically. But in fact, what we understand now today is that cancer has many different pathways. Some are indolent, or what we call idle, indolent lesions of epithelial origin. So you might have a normal cell that goes to atypia or, or in situ disease and stop at stage one disease and maybe regress. Or you might have a cancer that has a slow progression, very slowly. And these are the cancers for which uh, early detection would make a difference. Whereas in the idle cases, early detection won't impact mortality and in fact may cause harm. Those cancers that are rapidly progressing that show up may actually have cells that are metastatic from the earliest point. So if someone shows up with a very bad cancer, in fact, the most important thing to do is to get the systemic therapy right. That's where, and in fact, you'll hear more and more about this, is that when we see people with serious cancers, we don't try and cut it out. We think that the cancer is already out of the breast and we need to give systemic treatment and give what we call so-called neoadjuvant therapy. And we use the response to treatment as our way to understand whether we're making a difference. So this is an oversimplification and there's things that are in between, but it's on this background that we have to rethink what is cancer. And that's where we are going to count on our scientists to give us a new definition for what is cancer. So in our new paradigm, if you think about this uh, this graph, uh, is this a pointer? Yes. Okay. So if you imagine over time that this is tumor progression, and these might be the periods of time at which you might be doing screening, that in fact, we now need to think about screening in a way that reflects our new understanding of breast cancer biology. So for example, this cancer that's growing very quickly and that will rapidly become, uh, will rapidly spread you can see how it would be highly unlikely for screening to make the difference in driving down mortality of this kind of cancer. Here we must focus on getting the systemic treatment right and then eventually figuring out how to prevent those cancers. For this cancer that's slow, more slowly growing, that will necessarily progress to metastatic disease, this is where you get the maximal benefit of screening. That's really where you want to focus your screening efforts. But for this cancer that's very slowly growing or doesn't really have the chance to, is not really going to progress to metastatic disease, but you can have potential harm through over-treatment and by not recognizing that that cancer exists. So last year, uh, a workshop, the National Cancer Institute convened a number of experts from who, uh, experts in very different cancers to really come together and talk about the problem of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, and partly to stimulate the science around trying to understand which cancer is which and to do a better job of recognizing it on time so that, so that we don't overtreat. And it's not that people haven't recognized that this exists. People just don't like to talk about it because they figure out, oh, well, we can't tell what's what. Uh, but I don't think that's a good enough reason for us to ignore this very critical issue. And part of, uh, part of, uh, part of the outcome of this was to write a, 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 a statement and send out a set of recommendations to the community to send a signal to the physicians, uh, especially the, the general practice community, uh, the, the patient community, to create a shift in philosophy so that it enable us to, to make changes and, not, and for people not to be frightened and to try and get an explanation for how was it that we came to think about early detection as being the way to reduce mortality when, in fact, it hasn't necessarily gotten us where we want, and how, are the, how can we start to make some changes to make it better? 
And part of this was also to get us out of this contentious debate, the people who are for screening versus the people who are against screening, instead to try and say what are some new ways in which we can explore, uh, uh, explore screening and make a difference. So the first is to say that no matter what kind of, uh, what kind of cancer, if you, if you screen, you're going to uh, see overdiagnosis. For those cancers that we can say, because of some biological mechanism or some uh, that we think that really are not likely to uh, be cancer, we should take the name cancer out of the, out of the name. And for some of these, to how do we get from here to there? Well, we start having some registries uh, to, to try and explore some trials so that when people hear about this, they say, oh, you can't do that, you have to treat. No, well, maybe these are cancers that are destined not to progress so rapidly and we can start to think about doing things differently. And it's very important that the public understand this. Every change in breast cancer has come because patients, women, consumers have demanded change. Uh, nobody likes treatment when they don't need it. We don't want to undertreat, but we don't want to overtreat. So there are some strategies that can help lower the chance of detecting unimportant lesions. And uh, we're going to talk a lot about that at the end. And maybe start to think differently. And this is particularly where we want to engage the, our scientific colleagues, the translational community, we really think about, is there another model for thinking about how to prevent uh, cancer progression and therefore target prevention in different ways? And there were a number of us on the working group, so a lot of these recommendations were a group effort. So the first was that we could recognize that overdiagnosis occurs and is common and is more common with screening. And what we see, and you saw this even with Jeff's slide, is that since the introduction of screening, the overall incidence of breast cancer has gone up. The local cancers have gone up, and we've had some drop in the, more, uh, in the stage two and three cancers, but not nearly as much as the rise in these cancers. So there's been a bigger jump in the local disease without as much of a change in the uh, more serious disease and the still persistent diagnosis of metastatic disease. And the same thing is true in prostate cancer. In lung cancer, we think about this as a disease as rapidly fatal, but in fact, autopsy and screening studies suggest that maybe there's a quarter of these patients that will have indolent cancer, so the more you look, the more you're going to find them. And what of that's been illustrated by the uh, recent uh, uh, lung cancer screening trial uh, using low-dose helical CT screening uh, we found that we could actually reduce the mortality by 20% in these high-risk individuals. But the problem is the incidence of the diagnosis of these stage 1A cancers is much more than the drop in these later stage cancers. So along with finding the cancers that are consequential, you're sweeping in a lot of these early cancers. And that's important for people to know. And, uh, and particularly because in the lung cancer screening trial, the majority of the lesions found turned out not to be cancer. So we have to make sure that we don't biopsy every, everything and we don't, that we control ourselves and not just uh, use fear to drive uh, a, a knee-jerk way of, of approaching uh, cancer. Thyroid cancer is a very interesting disease. Why is it that thyroid cancer, even when it gets into the nodes, rarely kills people, uh, the papillary cancers? What is that about the biology? That's actually quite interesting. What is it that makes some controllable? Maybe that's a clue to helping us understand uh, how, how to control cancer. But in fact, in the United States, it's become quite common practice to screen people's thyroids <coughs> and looking for nodules and putting needles in them. And we've, with that practice, increased the incidence threefold without bumping the mortality in any way. Barrett's esophagus is another condition that just explores why it is it's important to think differently and not just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And we're going to get, the reason I'm telling you this story is because we're going to get to ductal carcinoma in situ. So Barrett's esophagus is uh, something that we see commonly with, with uh, gastric reflux. It's a change. It's the end of the esophagus as it goes into the stomach. There are changes in the, in the, in the lining of the esophagus there that people think, put, uh, assumed, put people at very high risk for esophageal cancer. So people with Barrett's uh, frequently come in for uh, endoscopy, where they take a tube and look down there and they biopsy it. And uh, Brian Reed uh, actually started these longitudinal studies, thought maybe this wasn't true, 
and stopped biopsying, started following these people, and actually discovered that, in fact, the vast majority will never develop cancer. It's really a, simply a normal adaptation to reflux. And yet, we continue to screen and biopsy these people. So there's still a lot of fear that drives the way people do things, and it's not science-based. And that's part of my pitch is that we want to use science to help us direct and improve our aggressive treatments, but also help us eliminate those treatments where they're not needed. So what's the problem with diagnosing all these cancers? A lot of people say, well, isn't it better just to find them and let's then, then let's sort it all out? And I think the problem is that all treatments have consequences. Any woman who's been through uh, breast cancer treatment knows that that is not, is no picnic. And there's a toll physically, emotionally, and financially. And we want to be able to put our resources to really uh, improve uh, treatments where uh, people's outcomes are really in, uh, their survival is in danger. And unless we move to biologically based treatments, we will necessarily overtreat. Uh, and I think this was referred to earlier that chemotherapy actually is a, turns out is a fairly targeted intervention. It probably only benefits those tumors where the cells are turning over quite rapidly. Uh, and we now have some diagnostic tools that are helping us understand who we should treat. And it's important, um, I think Bruce mentioned that they had done a study showing that maybe 25% of people wouldn't get chemotherapy if some of these tools were used. And I think that's, in, in Australia, and I think that that's actually very important. It's an opportunity to safely avoid these treatments. And it isn't, and it's really trying to understand in cancer, this is the biology. You can have risk, but the treatments, you have to figure out, do the treatments we have really reduce that risk? Another important issue uh, in, is, is about radiation therapy. If a number of the cancers that we're surfacing with breast cancer screening are more indolent, or what we call idle tumors, then perhaps if we have the right diagnostic tools, we can simply, we can do a simple excision, and that would be sufficient, and maybe uh, the addition of radiation therapy would not be necessary. There are now randomized trials, there are at least 12 years out, that show that for women over 70, the, the addition of radiation adds very little, uh, adds, adds nothing in terms of mortality, and uh, very little even to the local recurrence rate. And the women who only maybe a 9% difference in local recurrence rates, and those people could be treated if they recurred very safely, that's a, that's a huge benefit. And it's particularly a benefit when you start to think that 50% of women uh, are diagnosed with luminal A tumors in the postmenopausal state. And it may be that radiation could be given as an intraoperative single boost or even not a, even just hormone therapy. And that really makes a big difference, especially people who live far. This is a big country, and if you live far from a big city, you know, a lot of people are being told that they need to have a mastectomy. This is an important way to improve the, uh, the, the treatment and the experience of a woman because you understand the biology of disease. So it's very important. And for all, treat, for all cancers, screening and evaluation of lesions carry risk, morbidity, anxiety, and great cost. We know that people who've gone through multiple biopsies are more likely to get a mastectomy when they're getting diagnosed. And uh, we know in the United States, actually, that uh, the use of the widespread use of MRI has increased the mastectomy rate right, because of all of the biopsies uh, that people have had. And uh, you know, to, just not to pick on breast cancer, I think it's actually important to understand that this is common across cancers. So in this lung cancer screening trial, 30% of, of people had a positive screen. 96% of these lesions were benign. So it's really important for us, just because you see something, you want to be judicious about what do you have to biopsy, because this really frightens people and changes their experience. And some of the factors that reinforce the decisions for aggressive screening intervention that I think keep us from being able to be innovative and do different things are that if you've been screened and you do have a positive result, people think, oh, it was caught in time, uh, and if it's negative, you're grateful and reassured, whereas if you weren't screened and you have a cancer, you think it's a missed opportunity for early diagnosis. And in the United States, in particular, people are very afraid of malpractice. I don't know how much of an issue that is here, but it is a big issue in the, in the US. 
And in someone who's been treated uh, and they're cured, they're grateful. And if they're not cured, they feel like everything was done. Whereas uh, if they weren't screened, they think, well, could more have been done? But I think it's very important that the worst cancers, the most aggressive cancers we see, are those cancers that come in between screens. We call them so-called interval screens, interval cancers. And the reason I bring this up is that if you have, a lot of people think, oh, I've had a mammogram, so if I have a lump, I don't have to go in and get it evaluated. But that is not correct. Because if you have a symptom, 50% of women still present with symptomatic breast cancer. And those often are the more aggressive cancers, and they need to be paid attention to. So it's important to know we can't make screening something that it's not. And it's not a perfect tool. So the people need to understand that, and we do need to make some changes and figure out how to improve it. So the magnitude of the problem in breast cancer is, is, is enormous. So in the US, we have 300 million people. So uh, the problems that we have are, magni are magnified 12 times uh, your population. So we started our focus of screening first on invasive cancer, and then to precancerous lesion, and then any calcification in our zeal to try and find anything early. But in fact, that has led to about a million biopsies a year in the US, three quarters of which are benign. And there has not been an established benefit to going to that, sh to, to that shift, because we're afraid to let calcifications go. And it isn't that you're letting things go. You have to understand what is it you're, that you're after and what is the risk of watching something? Because some of these things are very slow growing and can be left alone. So it's very important to know that. And, and people need to know that when they have an abnormality, they can say, well, is this, what are you worried about? Are you worried about in situ cancer? Are you worried about invasive cancer? How serious is this? Is this something that I need to do something at? Is my risk 5%, 3%, or 80%? These are the questions that we often don't ask. And the aggregate cost of screening in the United States is enormous. Uh, partly because we screen every year, and we have not followed the scientifically based guidelines which recommend every other year screening, and I believe you guys screen every other year, which is much more sensible, I would say. But, you know, it costs the U.S. about almost $8 billion to screen about 65% of the population, and if we reached 85% of the population the way we screen, it would cost $10 billion. If we followed the U.S. Preventive Task Force guidelines, it would cost about $3.5 billion dollars. So it's not an inconsequential amount of money. In the US, because our health care is not organized, and still isn't organized, uh, no one really sees that aggregate cost. So there isn't a way to sort of move that into translational research. But you can see it still is a big impact. And it's, it's not so much about the money, but it's, it's the magnitude of, the, of, of where we spend our resources. We want to make sure that our resources also go into improving the outcomes of the people um, who are diagnosed. So as a community, we have to step up and call for change and demand some innovation and change. So we can and must do better. So what are the things that we can do? We can embrace the development of new terminology to replace the word cancer where it's appropriate. So what do we mean by that? So, you know, one of the first examples where this has been done is the urothelial tumors. In 1998, they changed what were called papillomas or grade one uh, carcinomas of the bladder uh, to a ridiculous name. Uh, and part of it, part of the reason they changed that was they said they wanted to remove the word carcinoma. And why call it carcinoma if it is never associated with invasion or the risk of recurrence and progressions are both very low? That, I think, is, this is not, as I said, what I'm talking about is not a new concept, but we need to move it forward and we use, need to use science. We have a lot of tools at our disposal now to help uh, train our, 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 fo our focus on that. Prostate cancer, Gleason 3 plus 3, for the most part, you know, I'll talk about this later, uh, you know, we now know from observational studies, those cancers, 99% of those people will not progress. So maybe that should be downgraded. These are things that we can do. And again, it, the understanding the biology of this can really help us uh, with the people who have more aggressive cancer. So this is this idea of taking some of these new companion diagnostics to help women feel more reassured and feel, oh, I can be more comfortable doing less. So what kinds of, that's really, to me, that's, that's my, uh, the task that I leave to the translational science community. So one of the examples of such a, a, such a, such a tool, there's a, a 70 gene 
prognostic uh, tool that uh, is now on the market called Mammoprint. And this is, this is the original study where, and these are all the people who had metastatic disease. And you can see there's this kind of group of red genes here and then this group of red genes here. So you can use this pattern to tell you, and there's an index, and if you let, move that index up, we call these ultra-low risk cancers. So is this the kind of biology where we can feel comfortable that these people will not progress? And that's something actually that we are in the process of testing and hopefully we'll know next year. We went back to look at uh, the fraction of patients pre-screening who had that kind of biology, maybe about 10%. And now in a more modern screening era, about 30% of, of patients have that. So there may be a substantial fraction of patients who have a very low risk of cancer. That should be good news because that means uh, there's a fraction of people who can be treated less aggressively. And um, that could mean just simple excision would be sufficient. And the right that's where biology can drive what we call a companion diagnostic. So if you get a screen-detected cancer, you would be able to get this, this test and know whether you had the good, and again, there's no guarantee that you'd have the good kind or that it's perfect, but it still would help you do less. So now I want to talk about DCIS. So DCIS uh, is something that was really primarily a diagnosis found uh, because of screening. So this is prior to the era of screening, and here you see this is the incidence of metastatic disease, here's the incidence of in situ disease rising, uh, and here is regional disease, this is sort of a node positive disease, and here is localized disease. And with this big rise in DCIS, we did not see a concomitant, the same drop in invasive disease, in localized disease. So think about it, what happened with cervical cancer is that when we started taking the precancerous lesions out of the population, the invasive cancer rates dropped. When we started taking polyps out of the colon, the invasive cancer rates dropped. So with this change, you have to say, you may be able to see it, but it's unlikely that the majority of DCIS detected is destined for significant cancers. So that's a huge challenge to our community. If we can't tell the difference between them, we're gonna wind up treating everybody the same. And I say that that really is not sufficient. That's not acceptable. We have to do better. So one of the things that we can do, uh, we know that DCIS is also not just one disease. There's high-grade DCIS, and there's low-grade DCIS, and there's some that are in between. And actually, the majority of these lesions tend to be low-grade DCIS, and particularly some of the ones that are kind of scattered throughout the breast, these are the ones that were driving women to have mastectomies. That probably is unnecessary, and I think Certainly, there is no emergency. So we have time and opportunity to then begin to do things differently. And the reason why I'm talking to the public about this is because if the public doesn't understand that the that different options are reasonable and not going to be life-threatening, nobody dies of DCIS. And the time trajectory for progression, if you're going to progress for a low-grade lesion, is 10 to 20 years. So waiting six months or a year or two years is not going to harm anyone. And that very well may allow, allow us to think about doing things quite differently. So just to give you an example of how diagnostic tools that come on the market can help, this is uh, a test that uh, was developed by one of the biotech companies in the Bay Area. And again, using looking at about 20 genes, they, they did a study of looking at the risk for invasive breast cancer over time, and they segregated uh, these patients into high, intermediate, and low. This is a group of women who were treated with excision alone and had uh, clear margins. And the thing that I noticed that was so interesting is that this low-risk group, after 10 years, had invasive cancer risk of 5%, which translates to what we call a Gale risk of 2.5. Now, the Gale risk is a risk score that we use to try and see whether people are at higher risk for breast cancer. This is about the average risk of a 62-year-old. So in fact, now these were excised, but in fact, this may be telling us that this is like atypia or a slight increased risk. That does not mean we should be taking people's breasts off or irradiating them. It means that we should be thinking about them potentially as high-risk lesions. And even this highest-risk lesions right here, this 19%, over 10 years, I'd like to point out that the average lifetime risk is 12%. So it's higher, but it's not that high. 
So we have to think about doing things differently. So lesions with a 20 to 30% risk of progression to invasive cancer should be considered high-risk lesions, not cancer. And it's not just what your risk is, it's when your risk is. If your risk is next month, it's different than if your risk is 10 years from now. And so, and it turns out that atypia, some of these low-grade cancers, are probably very hormone-sensitive. And prevention is a, great, is a great option. We have three FDA-approved treatments for prevention. There's no reason for us not to think about starting with those kinds of treatments first. And just to give you some kind of perspective, a BRCA1 carrier has an 85% lifetime risk of breast cancer. We don't insist they have mastectomy, nor do we radiate them. We give them options. Do you want screening, or do you want prophylactic surgery? Whereas someone who has one quarter of that risk is often told that they have to have an operation in the next two weeks. So I think that that's just not consistent with, with our understanding. And the good news is that if you have time, you can actually think about doing things differently. So it's not an emergency, and it's an opportunity for prevention. And I again, I want to bring this back to what we learned from the prostate cancer community. They're about 10 years ahead of us. They started an active, there's about four groups around the country who have started active surveillance for these kind of lower risk cancers that were being found by screening. And in fact, now the thousandth person has just been entered into one of these big studies. And they found that the survival rates are 99% at 10 years. So I think that we can have some courage. Again, it's not an emergency. And we have not proven with DCIS that early intervention uh, necessarily uh, makes a difference. So this is just an example of something that can be done. Uh, this, uh, this big uh, consortium that I run across the five University of California camp medical campuses, the Athena Breast Cancer uh, Network, uh, we actually are going to take a list of all of the, we're going to use the um, profiling tool to, uh, to profile every DCIS. We'll have about 300 uh, patients a year and give people all of these options. We're going to take this test, and for these low-risk patients, we're going to change the name because this behaves more like atypia <laughs> and a ductal neoplasm and DCIS and offer people different options they can choose whatever they want, but we'll give them information, and we will learn from the people who choose to do things differently to help inform the women that come after them. And I think that we'll find with time that people aren't progressing and are doing well. And we have, and of course, we've uh, a number of us have been doing these smaller studies and find that the majority of people will do just fine in a prevention setting. So just a couple more comments: the mitigating the overdiagnosis by testing strategies that lower the chance of detecting unimportant lesions. So what do I mean by that? Well, first, we want to be judicious about biopsy recommendations. In the United States, there's a, a term called BIRADS, and they classify uh, lesions one through five. And, and five means a highly likely, you know, 95% chance that it's a cancer. But a BIRADS-4 spans the risk from three to 95% for either DCIS or invasive cancer. And in the United States, we recommend all of those lesions be biopsied. But if there's even a small chance of low-grade DCIS, many of these lesions, these are about 90% of those, turn out to be benign. And if really the risk is only for a low-grade DCIS, is there really a benefit to going after? Is there an urgency to finding out about that? So these are things and new concepts that I think can make screening much better. We don't need to surface things that aren't going to harm people. And targeting more appropriate lesions will reduce the number of biopsies. So another way, in the US, we can screen every other year. That isn't going to increase the late-stage disease. And the other thing that I want to finish with is the idea of risk-based screening. By screening with risk, the people who have higher risk, we likely are going to get the people with more benefit. Now, this isn't proven, but I think this is an idea that is really worth thinking hard about. In most of these other cancers, that's where prostate cancer is moving. That's where lung cancer is moving. So we can both think about screening the high-risk people differently, and also people who have serious other comorbid illnesses are not likely to benefit from screening. So trying to be more biologically uh, based, uh, we're trying to use, set up a, a system to use an adaptive learning engine because we know that one size definitely does not fit all. 
What cancer could be is personalized. It could be based on the advances in risk assessment and biology. We think it could be more cost effective and integrated with prevention, which actually, arguably, is more important than screening. And not only could it be evidence-based, but it could be adaptive, where we could learn from the information over time, and evidence generating. I think one of the things we sometimes say, well, we can't do it unless we have 10 years of uh, follow-up data, but sometimes what we have to do is start to generate the evidence that will change practice. And because we want to find tools that are more effective at finding the relevant cancers. And I am definitely trying to make the analogy that we want to get away from, that is, uh, one of the first uh, home computers. We obviously don't want to be doing that. And I, I like to point this out, that if you were to walk in and buy a computer, uh, I noticed this nice Mac here. If I walked in and found that computer in the store, I would likely leave that store and go someplace else. As consumers, you are told or you are programmed to want something fancier and better every year. So why shouldn't we be demanding that kind of change and improvement in medicine? And we just have to be a little more creative and clever about how we do it. So our current risk models, um, which are certainly better than nothing, uh, were based actually on a big demonstration project. The Gale risk actually was based on a demonstration project from the late 70s, and the model was developed in the 80s before we even knew about ER estrogen and progesterone receptors. So I think we need to improve that. And we do have some new models uh, that are looking at that. But there are also, there's information about breast density that we know is important. And now there's new data on single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are the small genetic variations that seem to make a difference. And now we think may even help us predict who's at risk for hormone positive cancer and who's at risk for hormone negative cancer. That's very exciting. Do we want to wait 10 years for that? Didn't you say you were in a hurry? Well, me too especially as I'm getting older. Uh, so what I would like to do is figure out how to do risk assessment integrating with screening. We actually now have in our Athena network, when someone comes in for a mammogram, they fill out a survey which automatically turns in a risk assessment, and we take the top 5% of people at risk and do risk-based counseling. But we want to improve that and add these new models for risk and use that to assign the age at which to start screening, the frequency from which to screen, and for every tumor we get, to profile those tumors and to learn as we go. If in our low-risk group we're finding people getting interval cancers, we would change it. If in, our, if, if in fact the cancer risk is very low or they're really indolent cancers, then we can screen less. But it gives us a platform for change. That, to me, is what's ex exciting, to refine and adapt and to do it with time so that in three years or four years we can have some real information. If we were to do a big randomized trial the way we used to do it, it would be 20 years before we'd have the information and it would be out of date by the time we'd get the results. So the way something like this might work is if someone had very strong family risk, you know, again, someone who's a BRCA carrier would, might get every six month screening uh, at an early age with MR, MRI. Whereas someone starting in their 40s, uh, if, they, you know, if they're not at risk, if they, if they don't have any particular elevated risk factors in any of our parameters, they would go on to coming back at 50, whereas someone who's at risk for hormone-positive cancer would be screened every other year, but more importantly, could be offered prevention. Perhaps the group in their 40s who are at risk for hormone-positive breast cancer are the ones where we can make the biggest difference in preventing disease. If you're at risk for hormone-negative cancer, these are faster-growing tumors. We know that. That's a biologically-based hypothesis. We could assign them screening every year and test that. And the only group for whom every year screening in the 40s has made any difference or have been shown to, be, to, to lower the chance of finding late-stage cancer is the people with extremely dense breast tissue. Not a little bit, but extremely dense breast tissue. And that's a small fraction of the patients in, in our population. And so on with the next group. But it also, you can imagine what this is going to start to do is start to identify groups of people who really, smaller groups of people who are at risk where we can start to do real prevention science. So it's an engine for which discovery, uh, where, uh, where our clinicians and our translational researchers can work together to try and change the paradigm for screening. And this is our Athena Breast Health Network. And you guys are already at that, sharing your stories. But that is, again, uh, we have a big problem with privacy in the United States, and even though half the generation is the younger generation is on Facebook and doesn't apparently care about that, but when it comes to medical information, we don't want to share it. But of course, that is critical that we share that information because without it, 
we're not going to learn. So I think the risk-based screening model is more than just improved screening. And it's the idea of being able to have practice generating evidence where you're constantly improving what you do, where you can learn who's at risk for what kind of cancer and start to, with the recognition that breast cancer is not one disease, start to begin to screen for people and develop the tools that tell us who's at risk for your negative cancers. There's a paper that just came out suggesting that uh, HER2 positive cancer is much more likely to happen in the setting of dense breast tissue. So that may be something where we can begin to figure, figure that out in this 10% or so population who, who, who have that. And we can start to adapt and tailor prevention, biopsy treatment, and screening. And in fact, these are the costs. Um, these are the costs of screening. Uh, and, the, and for the, the people who are doing every other year screening, all of the, even the risk-based screening, even including the extra tests would still be in that same range because you're tailoring, you're doing more for the people who need it and less for the people who don't. And you could, so the value proposition is this would be better care, it would be preferred by women, it would enable improvement, and it would be a cost-effective uh, uh, strategy. So I know it's something that Bruce Mann's very interested in as well, and I, I think this is a very exciting opportunity for us to try and think about changing things. And that ties in very nicely with the the very last point in, our, in, in the recommendations that this uh, overdiagnosis working group made, which was to embrace new concepts for how to approach cancer progression and prevention. We now know that the things that drive cancer are very complicated, and it may not just be about the cancer itself, but very importantly about the microenvironment and the, the tumor environment. And maybe part of our concept really should be about how can we change the environment to make it less conducive to forming a cancer and get there earlier so that we can prevent some of these terrible, uh, terrible cancers. And when we understand that someone has dense breast tissue, we know, for example, that tamoxifen can reduce dense breast tissue. What we're missing in prevention, actually, is blood pressure, cholesterol. Think about cardiology. We've made enormous strides in heart disease prevention why? Because we've tied early markers like blood pressure and cholesterol as surrogates to show that people are at risk for heart disease or stroke. And eventually, all the big trials no longer require that you have to look at uh, heart disease or stroke, but they look at reducing blood pressure, reducing weight, or reducing these, these early markers. So if density turns out to be one of those markers, we can focus on that. As we start to find out what some of the other markers of risk are, we can work on moving that. If we want to get to a prevention state, that's the kind of work that we're gonna to have to do. And it may be much more important, eventually, to get to prevention than it is for screening. So I think this is an opportunity for the, the scientific community to rethink and better understand the drivers of progression and develop better biomarkers of the tumor and the stroma, not just the tumor, but the stroma and the microenvironment. There's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm about immune-based approaches, and that's really gonna be about changing the microenvironment and the immune, local immune environment. And it may be more important to think about maintaining the ecosystem than cutting things out. I can say that as a surgeon, that I welcome that change. So the message for women is that mammographic screening is really but one of the tools to reduce mortality. It has some difference, but it's not a big difference. Women shouldn't feel that if their cancer, they didn't find it through screening, that somehow it's their fault or that they missed this big opportunity. I think that we have to know that screening is not perfect. It's not, we are not gonna screen ourselves into a cure. So we can't say, oh, we're screening, so that's good enough because it's not, and it's not prevention. So the opportunities to improve screening are the, being aware that screen-detected cancers, there's a larger chance that you may have more of an indolent or what we call an idle, an idle tumor. And so if, as we, it's important to start to demand from your researchers and the research community to help develop the tools to help us tell who's who so we can minimize treatment when it may not be necessary. I think embracing new approaches to classify and treat DCIS are, are I think it's, I think the time is here. Uh, I think that after, you know, I, I think everyone was doing what they felt was important at the time, but I think the data have told us 
They were doing too much, and now it's time for change. And new ideas with space greening is just one of them, but there are new opportunities to think about doing things differently, and I think that that's exciting. So the challenge for all of us, the challenge for improving biology is to redefine cancer, to have a 21st, def 21st century definition, not just what we see under the microscope, but really make it biologically based, or maybe even a challenge of, of treatment intervention. To not just have a knee jerk uh, about fear of cancer, but to be thoughtful and replace that fear with knowledge and to test new approaches, new approaches for your highest risk disease so we can be, do more, faster, and better to prevent death from the highest risk disease, lowest risk disease, to be courageous to do less. That's, in fact, why we're not doing a radical mastectomy, Halstead radical mastectomies anymore, and to really push for new screening and prevention approaches. The public should demand and expect change. It's the only way forward. And I would just want to close and say I think it is the community and particularly the public that has to help us and give all of us the courage and the power uh, to catalyze change. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, uh, Laura, for uh, I think it was both a provocative and refreshing um, presentation. I, I wonder that there is a little bit of time left uh, for some questions, so perhaps I'll ask all three speakers if they're happy to come up. I'm sure that the presentations have created a few questions and issues that we'd be happy to have aired. There are people arriving with microphones, so I might, uh, I might just start over there. Thanks. Hi, I have a question for Professor Esselman. Thank you, I'm over here. <laughs> Thank you very much for such a, a um, wonderful lecture tonight. It was very interesting to hear you talk about DCIS and recharacterizing that. Um, I'd be really interested to hear your views on LCIS and how far we are away from knowing a bit more about that. So it's interesting that LCIS, uh, Hagenson and the in the 50s declared LCIS not cancer and DCIS is cancer. And that explains a lot about how we treat it. I think that low-grade LCIS, just like low-grade DCIS, is just like atypia. And the reason why, if you show a lesion to 20 pathologists, even the same pathologist, you'll get one or the other diagnosis. It's hard to tell apart because they're probably the same thing. And I, I, I think that we need to make it a little less complicated. I think hormone-driven, you know, low proliferative lesions are likely best treated with hormone therapy. And it's interesting, if you look at the prevention trials, you have an 85% risk reduction in the setting of LCIS or atypia. So why would you not want to think about LCIS, low-grade DCIS, atypia all the same and say, oh, this is just like taking a statin for heart disease, that you could really dramatically reduce that risk. So I put all of those in the same category. Uh, and, and I think the high-grade Camino lesions, they're, more, they're, 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 a different, they're, a different, they're a completely different uh, situation. We need to come up with more thoughtful approaches for those as well. Notice there's a question down in the front here, thanks. My question was about something that was probably not discussed so much tonight, but I was just wondering if there's any hope for women who have already had cancer that has spread beyond the primary site um, in terms of um, innovation in treatment and um, potential new treatments on the horizon. So there are actually uh, a number of new treatments on the horizon. I mean, unfortun unfortunately, uh, we, when people are diagnosed with metastatic cancer, the game is about control now and not cure. And that's one of the reasons why we're, I think it's important to take some of these new agents and test them when people have high-risk disease because the game should really be about trying to prevent metastatic disease. That being said, there are a number of new agents coming out like PARP inhibitors for uh, people who have DNA repair problems BRCA carriers, BRCA carriers. Uh, there have been two new targeted HER2 therapies, pertuzumab 
uh, CAD Silo or, or TDM1 that, that again, focus and, and actually, um, actually there's about five different drugs on the market. The problem with these is, the problem with metastatic disease is that once you've got cancer cells that are out and about, while you can knock them down, they have this uncanny ability to evade, to eventually form resistance, and that's actually a lot of what the translational science community is trying to solve is how do these cells eventually, why they're so clever that they're able to get themselves resistant and eventually overcome. It's, it's rare that we can cure people, but we have done an amazing job of keeping people alive longer. And again, it depends on the kind of cancer that you have. Uh, but there is, I think, a tremendous amount of activity in this area. You want to... Anything? It's certainly a very active area of uh, research interest in the laboratory. It's recognised, as you heard, by the NBCF as an area of high priority. And um, we're now around groups looking at um, some of the survival molecules that um, all of our cells have, and, and these molecules become upregulated um, as cancers become refractory to therapies. And so, for example, our group's very interested in trying to uh, use new drugs that are being developed to, to, to target those survival molecules and make cancer cells a bit more vulnerable. That's the sort of thing that will, will take years and uh, hopefully um, we'll start in an early phase study next year. But these sorts of things take time and there are many other ways that people are attacking uh, the metastasis issue. Um, for example, cancer cells, um, as we've heard, that metastasize are, are likely to be present uh, very early on in a, a tumour's life. and so what we need to learn to do is to cut through the heterogeneity that, that is a, a cancer cell. So when a pathologist looks down the microscope, there's a sea of different looking cells um, sometimes, and certainly we know at a molecular level or genetic level, they're quite different. So we need to really understand what those key culprit cells are that, that misbehave. And there's a lot of research happening in that area to try to develop better markers that predict, as you've heard, to predict these adverse outcomes. So those patients can be treated more aggressively, but also to try to target them. And I, and I think actually another, I think, in, enormously important area is to, I, I, I feel very strongly that a lot of these new molecules that are being developed, rather than testing them first in the metastatic setting, which is what we always do, is to test them up front where people need the most. That would cut five to six years off the timeline. Because, you know, even... The, the poster child CML, you know, one of the leukemias that we know the, we know the molecular lesion, the new drugs in the, in the acute phase has, has, has led to a cure for 80 to 90 percent of these patients. But if you wait to blast crisis, even those best drugs will not work because the cancer cells acquire these, this ability to evade treatment. So my feeling is that as a strategy, as a national strategy, international strategy, get those drugs and test them early on. Once you've got some safety data, let's get them to the people who might benefit the most because if we can prevent it, that's so much the better. So that's just, that's not exactly an answer to your question, but it's a strategy to get there. I think we're running a little bit late, but we have perhaps time for one or two more questions. Um, this one over there, thanks. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Esselman, um, you mentioned um, density, breast density, as, as a high risk. Do you mean someone with, um, brand, uh, born with um, dense breast tissue or a change in, in, in breast density over time? So uh, we know that people who have extremely dense breast tissue, and that's about 10% of the population, has higher risk has significantly higher risk than the people whose breast tissue is very fatty. And now when you're young, your breast tissue is very dense. But as you get older, for the majority of women, uh, their breast tissue gets less dense. But there's a number of people, or there's a, you know, some fraction of people that don't. Now, that's actually another very interesting area of study. What is it about that tissue that makes a difference? Why is it that certain types of cancers, like HER2 positive cancers, are more likely to grow or triple negative cancers. Why is that? And is there something we can do to change that? That's, again, that's why I think that's an exciting area for us to study. Can we change that microenvironment? And you sort of think about, you know, if you're trying to clean up a neighborhood, 
-hmm. You know, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get, you gotta get the, uh, the reprobates out of the, out of the area if you want to really clean up the neighborhood. So that's that's sort of a, a way to to think about. So you don't mean a change in breast tissue as such. No, I mean that in, it's measured actually when you take a mammogram. It looks like a sea of white, or if you like on an MR, that tissue is very dense. It's one of those things that uh, is very helpful as you're older. It keeps your shape, but you know there's a risk for that too. So. <laughs> Sorry, I think we're going to have to just leave it for one last question to stay over there. Thanks. I have to apologise. I'm uh, fairly deaf, so uh, when you give me an answer, uh, you might have to talk a bit louder. Okay, but no personally... problem. I can do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I want to compliment uh, or say uh, you put a lot of work and you, uh, you explain things very well, and I compliment you on that. Thank now, you. I have two questions. Uh, I have uh, read that radiation from McGock... <laughs> Magography is much higher than for a normal x-ray and some people claim that having regular screening results in cumulative damage from the actual x-ray testing and could result, result in small tumours. And uh, I'll give the next question while I'm speaking. Are you aware of research on the results of using thermography instead of mammography? So uh, in answer to your question, uh, actually that uh, the only group that we really don't, uh, so mammography should probably not be used as a tool for BRCA carriers in their 30s. So we know that the breast tissue is the most sensitive to radiation damage from the age of 50 to about 30 or 35. And we know this actually from the old studies from Hodgkin's disease where women got radiation in that put them at enormous risk for developing breast cancer. And we know that young women who get radiation have some risk on the other side if they get it at a young age. But once you're past 40, that risk is actually uh, quite low. And uh, that is one area of significant improvement that the dose of radiation with the new digital tools has come down about five-fold. So it actually is uh, much better. Now, in answer to your other question, which is thermography, uh, it's a cool idea, but it doesn't work. All right. <laughs> so the idea is to take, uh, it's the same technology that, uh, that's being used to look at uh, airplane wings or equipment and looking for cracks. Uh, but, uh, and I, and I, uh, my, my sister, who's a mammographer, who, by the way, doesn't share all of my views, uh, <laughs> actually was participated in a large thermography study uh, where they use the latest equipment and the problem is that it doesn't find the cancers when they're there. And when it says that the cancer is not there, it can't accurately uh, project that. So it was a good idea, uh, but it didn't work. It didn't work. It has not worked. So that is not a substitute. And a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to get a mammogram. Let me go get a thermogram. That is not, that is not the answer. I think you know, using it, using mammography appropriately, and if we can start to figure out who is the group that really benefits most from mammography and, and do it at the right frequency, I, I think then that that really is a much better strategy. It's not something we want to throw away. It's something we want to refine. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, look, I'd like to uh, draw this to a close, and I hope it's been of uh, some value. Uh, to you all. And if there are uh, any burning questions, I'll, I'm happy to answer them after. And so there are questionnaires that people are welcome to fill out and deposit when they leave to see, to provide feedback. And, but in particular, I'd like to thank Carol, Laura, and Julie for uh, putting a lot of effort into the presentations today. Thank you. Thank you.